in the back of Amanda. <laughs> it's the back. Yeah, it's that one. So we're going to see the working one. Yep. No, no. So you would not necessarily want your clients to see all the open tabs, right. and that would not show up um, on the software anyways. So the reason it's showing up is because we're using the projectors. So that's just for folks who maybe didn't know that. So I just wanted to point that out. So your experience as an end user would be just this block here, and that's what your client would see. So not the, the open tabs and all the other piece, except for what they would have open in their software. Yeah, they would just see their own. So it, it seems like they will only see what you see in the little inset on your own screen. Yep. If you, if you look on Amanda's screen right there, that's... That's, the, that's what the client that's sees. Right. That's what the client would be seeing. So they would be seeing the therapist as the main screen and then their own face, just so they know what they look like and they have a frame of reference. But so, which is pretty standard for Skype or for, you know, the, the texting. But not he, for she will see not, the no, same thing. She'll see the same thing, but he sees up in the little square. Yes. Yeah. 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 Even if I minimize it mirror so that in your office, mm -hmm. this would be like that. Yes. If you had a mirror where your client would see themselves as well as yes. you. Yes. Yep. That's what it would be like. I wonder what effect that would have just in terms of personal feedback. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked yeah. about that. People who like really think they look awful. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> That, that, I mean, could be an issue. And this is what I look like crying, and this is what I look like, you know, and look at my double chin. And, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it just, I, for some people, this could be hard. It could be. And I wonder if that self monitoring screen could be shut off in this particular software. I believe. Usually they can be. Can. That's a great question. So. I believe you can. Yeah. I will also say, like, when the first time I did this, I was like, oh, no, no, I am not putting my face up on the screen for everyone to see. <laughs> and then we practiced it enough, and I've gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't care. I would recommend that a therapy <laughs> leave it open, though, so that you can see you know, um, what they're seeing. Yeah, the therapist yeah. wants to keep it open to make mm -hmm. sure that you know, they're not. You can also do things so I was saying, make yourself look better. You can put the... Uh, computer off on books or on top of something you can put lighting that's going to light up your face instead of making mm -hmm. shadowy because it can create a look that you actually don't really ever look that way in real life just because of the weird position yeah. in the light. Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah, you want to make sure, like at one point we were practicing the other day and it was like all I could see was like my shoulders, like the, the camera was angled weird so it looked like I was three quarter shoulders and like one quarter head and I'm like, oh, that's not, that's not right. You have to get used to it. You have to work with it a little bit just to get the right angles yeah. and the right lighting. Did they lose it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not, you're not showing online anymore. And the other thing we've noticed is eye contact. It's kind of hard. We've been practicing how to make it look like you're, because you can't look at the, you can't look at the client because then it's going to look like you're looking down at your keyboard. You look at the spot. Where the camera is. If you look at the spot where the camera is, some, well, sometimes it makes it look, depending on how it's angled, it can make it look like they're looking over their heads. So if you've got to play around just slightly with it. So that is essentially Doxy Me on that platform. Doxy Me also has an app for, did you have it for your Android or was it just Mac app? No, for the Android it says to go to, go to their website. Um, the Chrome. Use it through your phone. Okay, so you can use it on the Android from for Apple iPhones. They have an app that you can do, and it's just as easy as that was. So this one is very user friendly. This and one is also free. <laughs> so the basic version for this is free, um, and the free one does come with the signed BAA, and it is HIPAA compliant. Oh, so the free one. The free one. This was the only one we found that was free with a signed BAA. Yeah. Um, it also. They also have, you can upgrade, I think, to $29 a month, and you can get the ability to share files um, or share your screen with your clients. So if you do a lot of writing on the whiteboard, you, you wouldn't want to write on the whiteboard because it's going to show up backwards for them because, again, it's like the mirror. So, But you could have a little PowerPoint presentation and share that if you are into that kind of thing. Any other questions about Doxy Me? you like it? I've seen of it, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, as a group, we have been researching and exploring these for the past couple of weeks, getting ready for this presentation. So honestly, we haven't used this in practice. The one that we've used so far has been VC, 
in the past, but VC, as we know, is $199 per license. Yeah. So we've been looking at other options. Uh, this one, it looks like a very good platform. Yeah. But it's so a little tiny. Like, you can't, um, it's This is for video. This is video. But you can talk. Yeah. Oh, we just couldn't demonstrate it because we're sitting right next to each other. Yeah. But yeah, he can see me, I can see him. And, and, can and, talk. and it's going through the, just like it's, Skype. It is Skype. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's Skype. a HIPAA compliant okay. Skype. You can okay. think of it like that. Okay. Yeah. Compliant Skype. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I have my headphones. The earbuds were ready to go. We're ready to go. Yeah. But then only he can be able to. We can turn on <laughs> mics, but we might get a squeal. Yeah, it's going to start yelling. feedback yeah. issue in the same room. So. Is, there any, yeah. is there any reason not to use this for family, but to use it personally? Is there any disadvantage of it? For family? Yeah. Like As if. Oh, to speak with him? Mm -hmm. Or oh, you did with your own. I don't think there'd be. The only yeah. tricky part is you can't call somebody. Yeah. So you'd have to, one of you would kind of have to be a therapist, and the other would have to be a client, <laughs> and the therapist yeah. would give the. So it, it's well, a little no, tricky. But, <laughs> you can't, you but Skype and FaceTime work pretty well for that. Yeah, so you wouldn't just be able to, to click yeah. on your name and call you. You'd have to log in and have your thing and wait for you in the waiting room. And so, I mean, it would work just fine, but the, the functionality of it would be a little trickier. There is free VC. Imagine more stable there is free VC. platform and Skype. Yeah, free VC would work. Less yeah. buggy. I know people who use it for business things. Yeah, you can get VC for business, for personal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, pen, it's just like Skype. Yep. And we're going to demo exactly. VC right now. Yeah, we'll be showing VC too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can cut over to VC now. Yeah. Why don't we do that? So VC, VC was like the big daddy, right? That was the original? I believe it was one of the originals. So VC also has uh, cell phone apps, so you can use your cell phone with it. You sign up for an account. And VC runs with a um, with a, uh, a contact list. So you would invite, your, your client would download the application onto their phone or onto their, their device, I believe. And then they would be in your contact list and then you would invite them to a conversation. So you would schedule, like, I'm going to meet you at 3 o'clock online and then you would send them an invite or you just call them. So they'd log on, you'd log on, and then you would just call. So. Computer that didn't have the HDMI cable. Ah. Uh, no, I guess I didn't. Okay. So this is the free version. We'll be done. Mm -hmm. So with the DocSeeMe, does the client have to download anything? Negative. No, they are just. just uh, get that little link thing. It's just the link. They grab a link, throw it in the browser, and then it comes up. Okay. Right. Sure with VC, there is the application. Right. right. Yeah. Like what Amanda is doing here, she's installing yeah, the application the right now. So you just downloaded that on your computer. Yeah. Because I had it on the other computer. There we go. Happy people. And the app isn't huge. I've got it on my phone. It works well, it's got, like one of our guests was saying, it's very, very stable. So, probably more stable than Do you want me to try to call you or do you want to call me? Uh, you're calling me now. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There it is. So it's a, a slightly different look. It's not all in one screen and those two blocks pop out so you can kind of move them around. You can make one bigger, you can make, you can have one disappear. Big Chris. Big Chris. <laughs> So we have not paid for a, um, a license, so we're assuming that it looks basically the same as this. But this is the free version, so again, the I mean, they all connect very quickly. Mm -hmm. If you notice on my screen, I put Amanda up near the top. Mm -hmm. um, that way, if, when I'm looking at her, I'm actually, it looks like maybe more like I'm... Yeah, you're looking at me. Yeah, yeah, you're making eye contact. Are, are you finding the client by their email or by their phone number? Email. On this one. They, right, would, is that they would set up a VC account. So they would download the app and then set up a, a VC account. And then they can use that with whoever, wherever, whoever else is in that network. Um, so it's basically just if you're making a Skype call. If somebody has a Skype account, you can call them. It's the same thing with VC. It's just a platform. And you said the free one is not, doesn't have all the Correct. 
So that's on the, the client computer. But he cannot see he that. He cannot see that. So he can't. I have iTunes, but he can't see my so iTunes. So I thought suppose everything's set. So there's just two floating windows like this. Mm -hmm. Is this your voice I'm seeing? The, the yes. graphic? Yep, that yes. is what it's picking up. That's the audio that it's picking up on the microphone. And I have mine yep. muted, so it's, mm -hmm. I mean, so the microphone isn't muted, but my computer is, so there's no feedback. Can so we hear what it sounds like when it's not muted? Well, they might squeal. I can try it. I plug, I've got my headphones in, yeah. so it may, it may work. Yeah, I'll, I'll mute and see what happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Test, test. Oh, okay, I can hear you. Can you turn it up, Chris? You're coming through just fine. You're coming through my speaker. Okay, good. Or my mic. And, and you're coming through. Yep, I can hear them through here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 can I hear them talking through here? <laughs> Nobody likes to hear, right? <laughs> so, so that signal would actually be going from uh, your computer. Uh, it's throwing me off now. <laughs> so it's, it would be going out to the internet to VC and then bouncing back here to get into Chris's computer, and it's doing it that quickly wherever the VC server is and wherever, wherever that is. Yeah, that's, that's, the, noise. Yeah. that's the squeal. That's the noise that we were talking about with feedback. That's why we use we should use headphones. And that's yes. well, that, and that's partially because you're mic. So that's coming. I am. It's coming off of there. Mics everywhere. Coming, yep. yep. So, so that's the noise you just yep. want to be careful of. You may not need headphones, but if you hear yep. that noise, just shove a pair of earbuds in. And yep. it'll but stop. but if you noticed, I was able to talk with it without a microphone yep. or yep. Mm -hmm. headphones, and it's working. So. Yep. yep. And, and typically, you wouldn't be in the same room as a client because mm -hmm. otherwise, you wouldn't need to be having a television <laughs> session. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. So in my office, when I'm when I'm just myself and my computer, it works fine. I don't get that squeal. There's no feedback coming in, so it works great. But if I am using, I've tried a couple of different ways. If I'm using a separate microphone and trying to listen off of the speakers, it will pick up and make that feedback loop. So that won't work. Um, but if you're just using it off of the computer, that usually works. Um, but I, I prefer some sort of headset mm. when I do it. So basically all you need is a computer with that little thing now. Basically. Yeah. Yep. The yeah. camera. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Camera has, uh, and the client has to have that too. And then yeah. 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 Or a cell phone. They can be on their cell phone. Or it can be on your, your smartphone. So it'll work. Yeah. It's, got, it's got a microphone and it has a, has a, a camera right in it. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Should we, we should. Let's take a look at Theralink. Theralink, and uh, then we'll take a break. So then, to end the call, I can just go up to File and Call, and he's gone. He's gone. Goodbye, Chris. So I'm in as a client. So I think we can do an instant session. So Theralink is a little bit different because you can actually schedule sessions right through Theralink. So you can, Chris could, is it on Chris's, it's probably on Chris's screen, he can go to his calendar and say, I'd like to see Amanda at 4 o'clock on Friday, and it would send me an email. Mm -hmm. And then at 4 o'clock on Friday, I would go in, and I would be able to see his waiting room, which we can show. Um, but we're going to do an instant session now, which should be instant. Let's see. Show me. I 
think I just want to check what email I'm in. I have two, I signed in as a, I have two accounts because I've been playing with it so much. So I have a personal and a like a client and a per other person account. So let me see if I go in as a client. Well, he already requested, it could be, he already requested one with me. So that, that would be the schedule. Oh, yeah, the but I can, let's see, what time is it, 2.30. And this is one of the things that we didn't appreciate too much about Theralink, was that you had to go through this process with it. Yeah, so just to schedule, it wasn't quite as seamless as the others. Although mm -hmm. we were trying to do an instant. We were trying to do an instant, mm -hmm. so I, so this just sent him the request, but the earliest it let me do was 3 o'clock, which is why we were trying to do the instant one. <laughs> so, see if, did anything come up on your end? How about if you click on today's session, and just in the video thing, the video icon. This is where I kind of like Doxy. Mm -hmm. yeah. This one was pretty though. Reject. Doxy may seem to be the uh, easiest and the most cost effective. Mm -hmm. Which one? The that first was the one, first we, one did. That we did. Yeah. Doxy. Yeah. So I created the appointment. How many sessions have you used this for? I said it was the exact. Just a few. Okay. A handful personally. Yeah, I think I'm the only. So the Chris may have done a few on DC. Okay. Says, okay. okay. Let me start it. Yep. Uh, crisis call Hold on. about a month ago from one of my clients who was traveling to New Hampshire and they did a crisis call. I bet it's on my first time. Okay. Yep. So it's kind of worked out well. It was good. Right. Yeah, but you know, I think this is a supplement. It's another tool okay. in our toolbox that we can use with our clients. I don't mm -hmm. think this is going to replace my practice okay, or anything. Okay, you're not planning to like move to this. Okay. No, not no, not completely. I think it's you know if there's a snow day, right. and you know rather than cancel out my entire schedule, you know and try and offer a different day, I can offer it to my clients. Hey, why don't we get together on this platform, okay. right? Uh, or like my client was traveling, they were in crisis, you know. I'm in your reading. Let's talk. Okay. So yeah, it was very effective for de-escalating that particular client. Um, yep. So. Uh, uh, last spring, I was traveling. I was down in uh, North Carolina, and um, I had a client who called in. They had a death in the family, so this might have been something that I could have done with that client. So we just did a thing. But, you know, but this would be a great supplement. There's our little waiting room for family. I did not charge. This is actually just a website. Yeah, I did, I did download Fairly. You can't. Always charge. He said the invitation to the situation. It depends on the situation. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the new yes. laws coming in. Yeah. I mean, whichever you can set up with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I'm, yeah. so this is what we all do that. We all do what we can for our clients. So Chris sent me an invitation to my email, and I clicked on it, and it brought me here. And it says Chris Henderson has not joined yet. Are we? Uh, so here's our fair like waiting room. So the, this one was accessed through email. This was an invite he sent me for that instant appointment, oh, okay. and it brought me right to the waiting room. And then when he joins, okay, so his that's on your email. Okay. Yeah. So this is on my phone. It only is working on my phone right now, okay. of course. So I'm making the rounds. Okay. Um, okay. So, so click on that that I clicked on the email. Yes, it said okay. Chris has invited you to an instant okay. appointment. Got Click it. here to join. I'm just making okay. sure I right don't. So his cute little waiting room. You can pick what your waiting room looks like. You can go with a, you know, like a more beachy look, or you can go with a more rustic look. I think this one has a brick wall. And so I went to my email. I clicked on yes, accept appointment, and it's bringing me here. Is that letting you? It says I joined the So I think maybe at this point. Should we take our break? Yes, yes. And then maybe we can troubleshoot a little bit more. If we can get this system to work, we can kind of revisit this when you guys get back from break. So. And I'd like everyone to be able to play with them. Too. Yeah. Like, and then that's what we want to invite you to do. Actually, come and take a look at them if you want yeah. to. Yeah. Get a little hands on if we can do that. So. Does that make sense for everybody? Take a break.
Well, and if we come back right at 3, then we have our 3 o'clock appointment. Oh, that's why. So we still. <laughs> that's why. We have our 3 o'clock appointment. Oh, it's a 3 so. o'clock appointment. Well, okay. we were trying to do an Insta session, but <laughs> we also have something scheduled for 3, so. So there was a question. Uh, can Chris send you a message through Theralink? And say this, or how does that work? Is there some sort of instant messaging, or? Do you see that on your therapist end? Right here is my clients. So I can talk about the cost of that. I don't know. Okay. Let's take a break. And then we're gonna. We'll revisit this when we get back. Yeah, we're gonna let everyone <laughs> take turns and play therapist, yeah. play clients. So, any questions about? Any of these platforms that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so? 40 minutes? Hey, Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about lighting and setup of session? Chris is in a great place right now to talk about that. Chris, yeah. I think Chris looks like he has a halo on the back of his head because of the screen that's there. That's why I have to Oh, there you go. So, Sarah's just pointing out once again to be aware of what lighting looks like in your session, or where, where you're, you are in the position. You know, you know, his position is probably not optimal. You want to have your shoulders right in the, in the, the space. Oh, there you go. Excellent. So, I have a, uh, an associate of mine who works down in North Carolina, and she exclusively does internet. She doesn't see anybody face to face. And she does cash pay, that's what she does. And, um, and they're all in North Carolina. They're all North Carolina, yep, so that's what she does. So uh, she probably does about 20 sessions a week, and this is what she does. So, but it's, it's not what I would choose to do with my, you know, I think this is a uh, supplement to what I do in my sessions in my practice. So. But anyways, you have to be really aware. I know she has a, uh, one of those folding, what would you call those? Yeah. Like a wardrobe divider thing that you'll change behind? What do you call it? <laughs> it's one of those in back of her camera. Like a, a screen, yes. Yeah. It's a screen. So it's in back of her. And, you know, so it provides privacy and people can't see what's in her office. And that's what she uses as a backdrop to her sessions. So just be aware. Be aware of the lighting. And yeah. uh, you don't want to be in front of a window. You know, the lighting is bad there. Or have a lamp right next to you. Or, you know, so it's the lighting off. So I'm surprised this is actually yeah, he looks better. He looked better on my computer than on the mm -hmm. screen. So, mm -hmm. assuming you're not going to have a giant screen in your house, you're good. Right. right. So background noises. If you're in your office, one of the things is you know there could be a tendency to maybe forget your office door open, and especially if you're on your headphones. Um, but whoever's outside can hear what you're saying. So that's not compliant either. So make sure if you're in your office, you close your door. It's the same protocol that you would have for a face-to-face -face session. Turn on your noise machine and, and close the door in the office. So, so kind of common sense things, but worth saying again, highlighting. So are we at three for our uh, We're session? At three. We have one. So what's going to happen? Let's see. <laughs> Just a Pops up automatically. All right, it says I'm in my appointment, or it says I have an appointment. Can you invite me? It says invited, not connected. Not connected. So I, I, you know, we don't want to disparage any particular platform or anything like this, but we've been trying to work with this, and we've had mixed results, and this is kind of an example of our mixed results, so, or no results. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of where DoxyMe has worked really well. DC is a really stable platform that's been around for a long time, although you would have to pay for that if you decided to go in that direction. And this is kind of the challenge that we've been running into with this particular one. DC is the one that NASW said. Yeah, I see years ago. Mm -hmm. That was the most. Um, mm -hmm. Is letting me join now? Well, Skype. Yes. Skype is not yep. compliant at all. Yeah, you, can't use, you cannot use Skype. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, we're doing something. So it's working on her phone, but not on her laptop. 
Oh, we yes. got something. There it is. There we go. Ah. Oh, that's oh, there. Uh -huh. yeah, so, oh, and that's probably because of your phone. Mm. Yeah. What so happens here's when you turn your phone sideways? Okay, here's so how it looks. Is this fair? Is this fair? Is this fair? We're working. We're working. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's a lovely therapist. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. The screen on this one's a little weird. It's just a full split up and down. It's slightly different. So here's what it looks like on the phone. Is it showing up on the phone? Oh, yeah, everyone, everyone gets to turn on the big screen today. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'll try not to make anyone car sick as I move. The view. So I think one of the great uses for this where I've, you know, I have had, um, I, I had a husband come in for a session, mm -hmm. and his wife couldn't make it in. My husband, the husband was the client, so he was actually physically in my office. But the wife came in, and we had a computer set up, and she could talk to us during that session. I had some uh, grandparents come in, but they had a two-hour commute to come into the office. So I said, "Why don't you guys get online and let's do this?" We've got a technology hurdle with those particular folks. But, you know, I think those kind of situations are good. I don't know if anybody heard uh, me talking before we broke, but I had a client who was in New Hampshire, and she was in crisis, and she called me from the road, and, you know, she was in a, a space, so we did a session. So just to kind of stabilize her because she was in crisis. I think it's a great supplement to what we do. For me personally, and maybe some of you will go in this direction completely, I don't know. But for me, I think in my practice, it's another th thing that I can use in, as a, you know, something in my toolbox. So it's another element. So, um, so there we are. Sarah? Okay. So I'm mindful of time. Yeah. And what I think we might do is um, finish up the last few things that we need to do here, and then we'll leave the technology. We'll try to break maybe around quarter to four, and then that way folks that are comfortable that have used these things before, you can head out, and folks that um, would like to play with it a little bit, then you can do that. That's one of the good plan. So that's a way to look for other examples of technology that you can use. Find something that's comfortable for you. We have used um, Theralink before, and it's been really successful. In our office, we were actually able to combine four different clinicians together. It was, okay, we were like all over our building. But we were actually four people on the same call, which makes it their group capacity in that. So that's pretty exciting, we thought. Um, so, so play with it. Um, it does cost money. Um, we're sorry we couldn't get it to work very well here to show you, but they do offer a free trial. So you can sign up for a free trial and play with it a little bit. You said uh, Google? Um, you can Google like uh, online therapy platforms or therapy companies with a signed BAA. Because that's really what you're looking for is that signed BAA to make sure that that, trip, that, that liability is transferred over. All right? Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Is there any chance that, is there any of the electronic medical record programs, are they offering any of these platforms at all? You know? So I don't know a lot of them. Um, we use Office Ally in our office. It's, it's a pretty robust, integrated medical billing uh -huh. and office management solution, and it is our bread and butter. It, we upload any paper document we have. Um, we upload into the chart, and then we shred paper documents, so we're no longer keeping paper client files anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so it's really fantastic. I, I didn't know if any of these, because I've used Keralogic before uh -huh. when I was at EMR, but I didn't know if any of them were 
thinking of coming out with it. Oh, I'm sure they are. I, I don't know. <coughs> that's not in, Amanda, that's not part of Office Ally yet. No, okay, I didn't think so. Or, okay. Yeah, so I'm sure they're there. I mean, it would be nice if you're using any EMR programs to combine them. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, integrated. Um, we talked about documentation, billing. We did talk about um, a little bit. Remember that GT modifier? The question, Jenny, about the numbered modifier was the. Uh, what did we answer? My. Uh, we had that. GT for telemedicine. Yeah. And then your normal modifiers. But what about the? You said there's a potential for a location code. So. Oh. There, zero 02 looks like it's popped in as a new location code for telehealth specific, but we have not gotten guidance from the insurance companies yet saying, yeah. yes, you must use this for, for telemedicine. So yeah. don't like quote me on that. But right. I've seen that bandy about. So again, right, things are changing. We're going to see a lot as of October 1st or on October 1st. So keep current in that and um, uh, make sure your biller is using things that, uh, what, what they need to be. Um, we talked about ethics. Um, let's just run through a few of the things that we need to consider for um, your digital office. So we talked about that light from the front, be aware of distractions. My husband was traveling recently and when he was in the hotel, the chair that he would sit in had this really nice, very hotel-looking lamp, floor lamp in the back. So as he was sitting, it looked like he was wearing a white hat. And, and we would giggle about his white hat. So be aware of that. Um, that's a nice way of seeing yourself in, in, the, in, in the mirror or in that camera. Um, try to have direct eye contact, plain backdrop and declutter. Or in the example of my desk, you can have clutter, just make sure everybody can't see it. The client should have a private setting where they're not overheard and you should see the patient's um, face. Now your client would never come to your office naked, I hope not, um, but when patients are at home, they may have some different boundaries in their home. So, boundary set with them. Right? What is a boundary? Well, you would probably never, you would probably address if your client came into the office and put a beer on your table and cracked it and started drinking a beer during your session, do they have that right in their home? Maybe, maybe not. It's an interesting ethical thing. So can they smoke a cigarette? We have a no smoking office. That's their home. It's, wow, I don't know, what do I think about that? Um, can they smoke a cigarette but not a joint? Hmm. Right? I don't, right? I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. Well, are they impaired or are they not? That may be different in the substance abuse world with clients that are working on sobriety. Um, I, I don't know. These are things that you, were, you may need to address with your clients because you are in their space. They're not in yours. So issues of dress. Um, what they make this as part of your normal informed consent. Just like you say, hey, we're going to meet once a week. Come on in. We meet about 55 minutes. Um, here's all the toys you can play with. You need to get one thing out at a time. All these things we teach our clients about our environment. Make sure and talk to them about how you expect them to present to you. You talk to them ahead of time about the fact that they should be dressed. So we talk about appropriate attire and we talk about expectations in session, absolutely. So if I have a client that I normally see in my office and I'm gonna see them from home, I'm gonna let them know that I'm gonna be in my home office. So they're like, wow, that's not your office, where are you? So they're not surprised. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, we are in a different environment, but we're going to present. So I'm not gonna be in my jammies and you're, um, you know, let's, let's make sure that we're in a professional space. This is a real life thing. And let's make sure that we are um, meeting each other as if we're in my office. Um, okay, so appropriateness, I'm going to um, just hit some highlights here and then I'm going to do emergency management for, for this. Um, patients who refuse, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Let's not make them do that. No brainer, right? Okay, great. Okay, we don't have to do it that way. Um, if your client says, no, I don't want to do that, I just want to do the phone thing. Okay, we can do the phone thing. Your insurance company just won't pay for it. So if you want to pay for it, we can do that. If you don't want to pay for it, we've got to come up with a different option. Okay. Um, patients who are at risk of self-harm, you got to be really careful about this one because there are a lot of patients who are, have risk 
but who can be appropriate based on your skill level, your comfort level, and their presentation. So we're going to talk about emergency management, that, that the best way to manage an emergency is to get ahead of it and prevent it in the first place by doing your best to screen these clients and know who is going to work really well in this kind of environment and who really needs that in person in order to, to modulate behavior and to learn and to, to process things like that. Okay, so prior to that first appointment, clients need expectations set and they need to do their intake paperwork. If you are going to do intake paperwork electronically, um, our office has a patient portal, so clients get sent everything, it's HIPAA compliant, they do it, they send it back, we check it off, it stays in the chart. You can also use some of the electronic document signing tools out there, DocuSign is one of them. You create a, an account, you scan and upload your documents, you put the little signature or initial blanks and it routes to the client, they click yep, 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 they sign their initials, they sign their name, and it all comes back to you in a packet. You need to be very careful about a signed BAA because there are lots of these companies. Remember you are transmitting PHI, right? The client is agreeing to be your counseling client. Their name is on that, their date of birth might be on that, their signature's on that. So um, be careful if you find a vendor to make sure that, they, that you are comfortable with their security measures. Um, you're going to send your client a worksheet about how to access whatever platform you have decided to use. The client's going to agree to telemental health and make sure those expectations. Be dressed. Um, be awake. Please don't lay in bed. That's weird. Sure, whatever. Um, release of information, just like face to face. When, if you are, if you take on a client, and our um, the policies that come to us October first do not require an initial face to face um, consultation. You must verify patient identity the very first session. You need to see a picture of their driver's license and a picture of their insurance card. So you set up that first, you say, oh, hi, I'm Sarah. And they say, oh, hi, I'm Judy. You say, Judy, that's great. Let me see a picture of your ID. Okay, fantastic. Picture of your insurance card. All right, super, thanks so much. And then you need to document that you verified ID with the driver's license. Do you do that face-to-face? I do not do it face-to-face. -face. Um, we talked about it in our office, but because we have several client contacts with clients, face to face, there's usually enough collateral information that if a client was trying to steal identity or use someone else's insurance card, um, coming to counseling is kind of an odd way to do that. But if I'm online and I've never seen this client, I don't know them, I don't know where they're from, I don't know if this is a that this is really the person that it is. So theoretically it could be that it couldn't be the person in my office. It's just a very different interaction in the office. So verify ID. Um, you need to ask the patient where they are. Tell me what your 911 address is. Oh, it's PO Box, blah, 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 Washington, Vermont. No, no, you need your 911 address. So where would people deliver packages? Or where, if, I, if, you, had the, if you had a medical emergency, where would the ambulance come? You need to provide that to you because that's a part of your safety plan. So that's very, very important that you have that. Remember, each session the person could be someone somewhere else. So that should be part of your standard protocol. I don't think you need to you know, verify ID every single time if you have a pretty good memory for people. But saying, you know, where, um, tell me where, what's your 911 address for today? And making sure that you know where that patient is. Know any screening tools you're going to use. Review scheduling, privacy and confidentiality staff roles and responsibilities, if you have other people in your office that are going to be interacting with this patient, and um, you know, know, know how to use EMRs, your EMR with logins, and, and make sure that those are private with those automatic logouts and things like that. Each appointment, physical address. Is your room secure? Is your window open? You know, I don't tend to open my windows in my office because we're on a main street and there's a lot of noise, but I do open the windows in my house. So that's something I'm going to have to remember this spring, is to shut that window so they can't hear my kids playing outside or my, my session isn't traveling outside. Um, encourage your patient to make sure their room is secure. 
identify everyone in the room. One of the, the key suggested um, policies in the session is to start with the client and say, you know, hey, Sally, I'm going to go ahead and scan the room so that you know that I am by myself, that this is a private and confidential space for me, um, and that we are the only two people here. Can you go ahead and do that with your camera for me now, too? Okay, so that way you both, it's, it's again, set, set expectation for that. Um, emergency management we'll talk about, but don't forget that billing piece about what to do if the, uh, if the video goes down. Um, kids, kids love technology. There are some really great pieces of it. There's some challenges, right? If you've got the kid that's sort of boinging all over the place, like, oh, how do you keep track of them? You can buy panning cameras. We don't have those. Um, but there's probably going to be a support person involved if there are kids. Um, the elderly look for, make sure that you're paying attention for any sensory, cognitive, visual impairment so you know if the technology is appropriate for those needs. And, um, and understand that person's level of technology proficiency. That's going to be a real challenge. It may be a barrier. It may be something that can be overcome as that person gets used to it. So obviously you saw three very different examples of technology up here. One that's a website. One that actually required downloading something, and then another that required a pretty specific process in order to access. So keep that in mind for your um, populations. Rural populations, be aware of local so social and cultural issues. In Vermont, you're probably going to have a good handle on that. If you start practicing across state lines or you do emergency work with the Red Cross somewhere, you would really want to understand the local social norms and customs in that area and then what may have impacted them. So if you have a client that shows up for a first session, they say, oh, we just really relocated here from Houston, you're going to probably have a decent idea of something major that's just happened in their life. So just like face-to-face, -face, we want to keep track of that. All right, so we kind of talked a little bit about that. We log into the platform, greet the client, verify identity, scan. I want you to know this is a private space for me. Um, again, if you're going to do that, you need to know what's around. So if you're in your home office, making sure that scan is appropriate for your personal boundaries and um, going to make that client feel secure and not overwhelmed. Um, introduce everybody. You know, use that social chit chat that you normally do. Do your conformed consent, informed consent assessment in, <clears throat> in history. Be aware that just like in face-to-face -face client session bomb in the last 10 minutes, um, I forgot to tell you, I've been feeling suicidal. It's awful. Um, great. Uh, because we're probably going to see the same limits as we do in face-to-face -face where, you know, an hour is an hour whether you run an hour and a half or not. So good time management is important. And schedule the next appointment based on time and your, your policy for that. Um, cultural competency, again, you're going to um, know what's going on in that client's world. Be aware of regional and national issues that may affect populations. Again, you this may be less applicable if you're going to just practice in Vermont, but if you're going to step out and take an opportunity, certainly be really aware of these issues. Okay, emergencies. So, we have a document on your drive that we're going to give you. Jim went through some of these. Um, we thought these documents would be helpful. Some of them we use in our practice. Some of them we've just kind of collected and thought they would be helpful for today. Um, these are not legal advice. They are, hey, these, some of these have worked or some of these are interesting for us. So, um, consider if they are helpful to you, and then use your own legal counsel to work um, on those. This is the, the big one. This one has several pages. This is a telemental health consent that we found online that we thought was really comprehensive and, and really good. So that's in there. There's also this um, suicide and threat assessment document that I think, you know, every now and then you find something online, you're like, oh, i got to never use that. Don't ever use this. This is a really good one. Um, this is a nice one. It goes through demographics, mental status, behavior, and it really allows you to really to comprehensively assess the potential for threat. And this would be a great document to have on your desk or in a stacker on your desk when you're doing a telemental health call 
so that if someone says, by the way, I'm, I think I'm going to die. You're like, oh, that wasn't how we were going. We were just talking about your dog. Um, you, can, you can switch gears really fast, and you can do a thorough assessment. Because if your client is in the tippy, tippy top part of Vermont, and they're 25 minutes from the nearest EMS, that's a challenge we face in a, in a rural state. If they're you know, in Barrie and they're right around the corner from the fire station, you've got time. So this threat assessment really helps you figure out, how do I respond to this? Because I don't have the doc two offices down. Do I call 911? Do they? Is there family that can come over and sit with them? What is the level of this, this threat? So um, I hope that this is helpful. Um, a lot of potential factors and risk factors and things like that identified in there. So. All right, so we're going to assume everyone is in an unstructured setting. So no staff is available. You're it, and your patient is it. Maybe they're a parent, maybe they're home alone. We'll just assume that they um, don't have any staff. So we're going to use assessments to help, us in, to help us at the beginning of a relationship decide whether or not this is a client suitable for a telemental health platform. So previous lethality, previous um, suicide attempts, previous significantly impulsive behavior, um, finding out about those issues and how they presented and how they were resolved. Does the client have personality disorder? Um, uh, low discovery suicide attempts and, and current instability. These would all be red flags. Um, they don't necessarily rule somebody out, but they certainly make your obligation to the client a little bit trickier when you're not right there with them. Um, you need to be knowledgeable and about basic training in suicide prevention. Here's another one of those great things that say, by the way, you should do this, but we're not going to define how. So if a suicidal client makes your hair stand up and you're like, oh, no, then that would be a rule out if a client has that in their history for you. Okay. Um, make sure you're comfortable with what you take, and if you had to talk someone through a situation, make sure you're comfortable doing it without being right there with them. Okay. All right, how do we involuntarily hospitalize someone in Vermont? Anybody give me a rundown? Yep, and they do what? Call your designated agency. Call your local screener. Mm -hmm. And then what? And do they still have the QHTP people or? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yep. So, so then the client, um, how do clients get involuntary hospitalized? So you call and you let your designated agency know there's a problem. What happens next? How does that client then get, what's the process for them getting involuntarily hospitalized? From the local mental health agency. Okay. to be involuntary hospitalized in Vermont. It requires the evaluation of a screener. It um, requires, so screener is part of the mental health, community mental health team. Um, they are qualified mental health pro uh, professionals, QMHPs, and they either have to make an on-site assessment of the patient in their home or their environment, or they must do a hospital-based assessment. Then they must be seen by a doctor. Um, it is very difficult in Vermont to have to have a patient involuntarily hospitalized. So that is often not a tool at our disposal. Um, police can be cooperative. They do their best. And sometimes if a patient refuses treatment and there doesn't appear to be imminent risk, they, they can refuse to be transported. So these are some, some sticky pieces. We do have a community-based mental health system, even for our most um, the, the most severe persistent mental illness that we have. We believe clients have the right to live their lives um, in the community. So when we bump up against a situation where there's a hospitalization need and a client isn't willing, it's, it's difficult all the way around. 
Um, if you are licensed in another state, please make sure you know what the process is for involuntary hospitalization and in, under what conditions. When I was uh, in, licensed in Missouri, in Missouri to hospitalize a patient, I had to write an affidavit and so did another police officer or a doctor. And that was it. So I, as a licensed professional counselor, could write one affidavit and a police officer could write an affidavit in the emergency room and that patient lost their rights for 72 hours, even if they haven't seen a doctor. So that's a very different system and it is a system that is far heavier and, and places more of that responsibility on that provider to get in front of the crisis rather than here where we are more tolerant of allowing the crisis to play out um, to, certain, to certain places. So there's benefits and drawbacks of both sides. So make sure that the laws can be dramatically different in each place. Make sure you know what that, what that looks like. Emergency management starts with informed consent. So the informed consent piece includes communicating those expectations prior to the first appointment. If your client is resistant to giving you their address, that's a red flag. If the client is non-compliant with parts of the process or resistant to paperwork or other normal pieces that, that, are, that need to be part of what you are agreement with that client, those are red flags. Um, so be thoughtful as you go through the process of informed consent, whether or not that patient is going to be a good fit for telemedicine. Um, you should have agreement with a client that they will be transported if in your professional judgment you feel that it's necessary for them to be evaluated. The client that says, I ain't going to a hospital. I've done that before. I'm not doing that ever again. Maybe that client's in a place in treatment where they, are, they won't need that level of support, but be careful to make sure that if they're resistant at that point, that you have a good, solid plan, or solid people around that person that can come and check on that person if necessary. So there's that dressed thing again. Um, and make sure the plan is ready for technology. Um, just basic assessment is the client in psychological distress, the client that Jim talked about that had the crisis, he's treated for some time, years, Jim, right? Yes. So he treated that client for years, he knew her extremely well, this was appropriate because he's managed these situations um, with some frequency with the client, so that was perfectly fine. Even though this client goes into some pretty intense distress, he was confident that this was appropriate. Um, if the client is in psychological distress, proceed carefully, consider additional assessment, collateral, collateral information, records review, family, um, any of your resources. And if the client is actively suicidal or homicidal, be really careful. I want to be careful about not setting boundaries for you and saying, never, ever, blah, blah, blah. Because every patient is so unique and so different. But maybe in your own practice, you can say, I think this is a professional boundary for me, that this kind of client would be difficult for me to manage this way, or I don't know, if I'm looking at a suicidal client and I don't have a lot of nonverbals because they're totally flat, how am I gonna assess that? And this client has a history of that, for example. So really looking at that, or maybe saying, I'd love to move you to telehealth, but I really need you to, to get to know you in my office first. And then maybe you can make a, a better assessment of that for you. Um, intent is really that, that sort of next step. So if you have a client who's actively suicidal or homicidal and there is intent, um, that's really one of those steps in that direction that it would be hard to justify clinically if you were called accountable for a bad outcome that um, that was a, a good patient to start on a telemedicine platform. So think through those things really carefully. <clears throat> All right, we manage mental health emergencies very similar to face-to-face. -face. They do require some preparation. We want to get ahead of them. We want to know if your client has any weapons on site. You can make that part of your just standard informed consent. Part of the questions I have to ask you include, do you have weapons in your home? Yes, yes I do. I am a Vermonter. <coughs> Great, can you tell me how they're stored and, and some information about that? Oh, yeah, they're locked in the gun cabinet or whatever. Right? So at least you know. Um, if the client has a history of any violent ideation or suicidal thoughts or anything like that, you probably want to say, so what are we going to do if these guns become an issue? What, what are we, we going to do if, if you go through a time where you're feeling unsafe? 
What can we make a plan with those? And then hopefully there's family or friends or others that can be part of that, that plan. <coughs> if client refuses to safely um, interact or secure firearms, that's a big red flag. Absolutely big red flag. Three emergency options. Um, local emergency resources screeners are our designated agency emergency responders, local ER, and patient support people. These PSPs, as they're called, are um, if you're seeing a child, that's the mama or the daddy or the grandma or whoever's there to make sure that the kid's got everything they need and, and can manage the technology. Um, we would probably call this the emergency contact uh, in our standard face-to-face -face practice, but we want to make sure that these people are involved in your client's life. So who can come and check on them if they're not doing well um, and, and having that person, not somebody they haven't seen in 10 years, they think might work, um, but somebody that, that can. And sadly, some of our patients don't have anybody, and that's a reality too. Oh, and uncooperative patients. It all goes well until it doesn't. Um, right? So one of the things that we consider is we're just going to manage circumstances the best that we can. So when you've prepared for it and it comes up and it all goes badly, it's just like it does in our office. We do the best that we can, but we had a solid plan to start with. I think the worst case scenario is when you went, well, I don't know, but I guess we can try it. And then it all goes badly, and you're like, ooh, I kind of thought that might have gone badly. That is a very different feeling than being confident starting telemental health treatment with a client and, and, you know, and then it just didn't, didn't go the way we planned. Um, be prepared that the primary support person, the patient support person, may not cooperate if the, parent is, if the patient is adamant about not wanting support. So you call um, Aunt Susan and you say, so I really need you to come and check on so-and-so. And she says, nope, already, she already sent me a text. She said, do not come over under any circumstances. She does not want help. So that person may not comply and you may have to use that 911 address and, and have them see. Um, know the barriers and the limits to transportation. So if the client, again, is 25 minutes into the woods and it's mud season and, right, I mean, this is all possibilities where we are. So know the limitations of that. Ideally, that family support person, it also helps in that, that personal support person, so that that patient can then be supported by their family and someone else is helping and it's not just you trying to do all the supportive stuff. Sometimes it's going to work that way. Um, but hopefully that fo those folks will help. We want to know the distance of the client's home to the ER, if this is a client with some potential acuity. So are they 45 minutes from the nearest ER? So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pull an action plan on that a lot faster than you might be the patient that lives around the corner from, from, from the ER. When you start a new session, always ask if there are any changes. We routinely do this in face-to-face, -face. any changes in insurance, anything else I need to know from last week. Ask that here too. So you're going to ask, what's your address for today? And are there any changes? Is your patient, is your, your support person still Aunt Susan? Yep, yeah, it is. All right, perfect. Okay, best practices. Never, ever, ever leave the client alone. So this is kind of unusual because we're virtually with the client. But stay virtually with the client. Never leave the client alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do your basic assessment. Keep the client on the phone or video. Remind the client about your agreement about safety and their agreement to um, participate in that. Contact help if you need to. Um, if there are weapons in the home, do not involve family at that point. Call first responders and make sure they are aware that there are weapons in the home. And then once, they, once those first responders arrive, you're out. So you let that go, you step back, follow up later, um, and defer to the judgment of those folks. And this, the unfortunate part is that sometimes that judgment is the patient's fine. Or they're not fine, but they're not willing to go, and that's their right. Okay? So, so be prepared for some of those things and manage as um, assertively early in the, in the day that you can. 
So a couple last things um, and some final thoughts. Thank you for being here today. We were excited to meet you. Appreciate your interest in telemedicine. We're really excited about it. I think you're going to see, keep your eyes open for more of these cloud-based clinics. I think we're going to start seeing those. I think we'll see more of that in Vermont. <coughs> where clients and patients can access mental health support in real time when they want it, not just have to schedule out. Um, we use an app in our office called Slack. And Slack is um, it's kind of a cool little thing. And it's kind of like texting, but in a uh, cooler way. And you could have different channels and things like that. We are going to create a Slack community for telehealth and invite you to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. It's just like a collaborative chat room. And you can ask questions there. You can share, um, share, share, updates. share updates. You can share documents. Um, if you come across something, you're like, hey, look at this article, you can post a link there. So it's, it's um, LifeMap is not really going to provide anything there other than to set the space up. And we would love for you to just collaborate because I think keeping our collective eyes and ears open for best practices, changes and things, um, this is how we all make this practice really good, um, how we stay informed, how we stay out of trouble. Um, and, and if there are challenges. So we've, we've really enjoyed dialoguing it, using it for dialogue in our office. Uh, you can set it up to send you notifications, so little pop-ups and little dings on your phone and stuff so you know when there's messages. You can also shut those off so it won't annoy you if you don't want those. Uh, and then you can actually direct message in it too. So outside of the group, you could send one to at Sarah um, or at Amanda, and then um, there would uh, be a message that would, would go out like that. So we'll invite you to do that. We'd love for you to, to, to help support us and support each other. Um, we are going to do a couple other seminars coming up. We are going to do um, a HIPAA for the small office. And we kind of geek out about that in our office, as you probably noticed. So we're going to do a refresher. It's good training, um, good updates. And we're also going to do another one, managing the suicidal client, uh, client, as well as aftercare. So if you've never experienced a client death, it can be, one of the, it can be a, a career changer. Um, regardless of whether you did everything you could, whether the situation was super traumatic and um, really hard or whether it was um, expected in some cases, it is still really hard as a clinician to, to move on, to gain your confidence, to get support. We're going to talk a little bit about um, that as well. So it's hopeful that none of us ever have to deal with that, but the reality is that um, in practice we often do lose clients. So we've got resources for you. We've got a thumb drive for you. All of your certificates are here on the, um, the table as you check out. We're going to set up technology down here so folks can see that technology. Feel free to come and play with it. Um, we'll invite you to the Slack group if you'd like to participate. If not, you're welcome to decline. And um, do you know who the social workers are? So we can get back to them with CEUs. No, actually. I didn't know who was who. So okay, so if you, I know, we didn't put credentials on those. So if you are a social worker, if you could see Amanda and let her know, she'll put a little star by your name in our list so that when we hear from that board, we can let you know and send you a new certificate, okay? All right, take care. Have a great weekend, and thanks so much. Thank you.